Welcome to episode 12 of The Crisis, a day-by-day account of Britain's 1931 crisis brought to you 90 years on. As we learnt in our last episode on the response to the formation of the national government, although the Liberal and Conservative parties were firmly behind Macdonald, the vast majority of the Labour Party was now opposed not just to the new administration, but also to the whole concept of spending cuts, despite the Labour Cabinet's agreement to a program of £56 million worth of cuts on the 19th of August. It was clear that, far from a three-party unity coalition when Parliament returned, MacDonald and the colleagues that had followed him, most notably Chancellor Philip Snowden and the Railwaymen's leader Jimmy Thomas, would face a considerable backlash from the party they still belonged to. The House of Commons sat for the first time since 31st of July on Tuesday, the 8th of September, and very quickly a debate on the national government itself took place, which was in effect a motion of confidence in the new cabinet. First, a message from the king was read, explaining the intentions of his new government, and then MacDonald opened proceedings with an explanation of the crisis and the formation of the new government, the thrust of his argument being summarized in the following quote. Quote, Honorable members who are representing labor but not more adequately than I am and that I shall be doing have to remember what would have happened if nothing had been done to avert what was maturing over our heads. Sterling, as I say, would have gone off the gold standard without management or control. It would have tumbled. Arthur Henderson, MacDonald's former colleague, then stood to reply as leader of the opposition. He expressed regret that Labour had lost men who had built the movement, but criticized the concept of the national government. Quote, We, Labour, have the largest party on this side of the House, notwithstanding the baker's dozen of defections which have taken place. And thus, how could the government claim to be a national one if the biggest party in Parliament opposed it? Henderson then went into detail about the dealings of the Cabinet Economy Committee and the fallen Labour Cabinet, criticizing MacDonald's conduct, especially his failure to call a meeting of the whole party, insisting he and his colleagues had only provisionally accepted the £56 million of cuts and had never got to see the complete picture. He also questioned whether the whole crisis had not in fact been whipped up by the press, but conceded the following, quote, I am not laying down any complaint about the bankers. I would not dream of doing so. I think the banker is just like anyone else. If he has to find money for me, he ought to be in a position to lay down his conditions. As we saw in the midst of the Labour cabinet split, Henderson never questioned the nature of the crisis or the solution. He simply didn't wish the Labour Party to be responsible for the terrible cuts that were being proposed, and would rather the burden was passed to others for the sake of the unity of the movement. Next came a variety of speeches from senior politicians on all sides. Winston Churchill showed his lack of enthusiasm for the national government, from whose cabinet he had been excluded, saying Henderson was right to belittle the terminology, but praising the motives behind its formation. He also made the first call for an immediate general election, saying, quote, There will be no restoration of confidence at home or abroad until the Socialist Party, i.e. Labour, has been decisively defeated at the poll. We need a government instrument commanding the support of the majority of the people of this country. James Maxton, the famous Clydeside radical left-winger of the ILP, criticized the Labour Party from the other flank, berating them for accepting any cuts at all in cabinet and saying, quote, what is the difference between the two sides? The difference is that one will go ten-tenths of the way and the other will go nine-tenths of the way. Sir Oswald Mosley, who had left the Labour Party the previous February, also mocked his former colleagues, belittling their belief in a banker's rant. The theory that the Labour government had been deliberately forced from office by a conspiracy of bankers who had invented the crisis to oust Labour. Conservative leader Stanley Baldwin's speech was mainly a justification for his joining the national government, but he did have a warning from the Labour opposition. Quote, if foreigners feel that there is a large section of the community in Great Britain at this time which does not realize the gravity of the issue or is reluctant to face the difficulties, that mere fact itself will tend to render nugatory a great deal of what we may do, and will prolong, possibly to a dangerous period, the length of time in which we hope to recover financial stability and the credit of our country in the eyes of the world. Baldwin's words and worries were to prove pertinent in the coming days, and the fact remained that the crisis, at its heart, was a confidence crisis, and therefore the words of politicians mattered almost more than economics. In the division, the national government won its vote of confidence by 309 votes to 249, with the government support being as follows, 243 conservatives, 
53 Liberals, 12 Labour, and 3 Independents. A further 5 Labour MPs abstained, refusing to vote against Macdonald. What the vote made clear was that the national government was safe for the time being, but that Macdonald could rely on a very small handful of Labour members to support him. On Thursday, the 10th of September, 1931, Philip Snowden presented the government's emergency budget. He informed the House of the projected deficit of £170 million for the coming year, and then outlined the tax rises and budget cuts that would balance the books and thereby restore confidence in Britain. The economies amounted to £70 million, some £6 million less than the figure the Labour cabinet had so fatally split on. The program of cuts was the same as the £56 million the Labour cabinet had agreed on with the addition of the 10% cut in the rate of unemployment benefit. There was also £80 million worth of tax rises. The tax rises took the form of an increase in income tax, the reduction of the personal allowance on unearned income, as well as higher duties on beer, tobacco, and petrol. The war loan would be converted to a lower rate of interest. Overall, Snowden predicted his measure would produce a budget surplus of £1.5 million. The budget was presented in an acrimonious and hostile atmosphere, and the Times reported that the opposition, quote, filled the air with snarling, irrelevant, and ignorant interruptions unworthy of any serious parliamentary occasion. Nevertheless, Snowden put in an impressive and authoritative performance that was cheered for several minutes from the government benches when he closed, and he also received several notes of congratulation from former colleagues. Willie Graham, Snowden's protege and ally, now deputy leader of the Labour Party and their new financial expert, responded for the opposition. He spent most of his speech going over the discussions of the fallen Labour government and claimed that the £56 million Snowden had mentioned were only ever provisional, never accepted by the cabinet until the presentation of a complete picture. Graham also repeated Snowden's own words of the 20th of August that there was not to be a cut in the dole, a dispute over interpretation we discussed in a previous episode. More forthright were the views of Labour MP and former Financial Secretary to the Treasury, Frederick Pethick Lawrence, who spoke out violently against the budget in the increasingly popular Labour language of international financial conspiracy. Quote, I do not speak in terms of exaggeration. I choose my words with the utmost care. I am not speaking the language of hyperbole. I am speaking with deliberate intention and a careful use of words. And I say that this government has been formed with the express purpose of placing the neck of this country underneath the foot of foreign finance. The following day, the 11th of September, saw the second reading of the National Economy Bill, Snowden's budget. The discussion descended into a messy debate about the discussions of the former Labour cabinet and its economy committee of five. Who had said what? How much had really been agreed? What had the Labour leaders really committed to? And should the confidential discussions of the late cabinet be revealed in public? Ramsay MacDonald riled against the line Labour had repeated since Parliament had reconvened, that the cuts and tax rises the Labour cabinet had come up with were only ever tentative suggestions and never policy. In a speech dripping with sarcasm, he said, We were told that all these schemes were tentative. Everybody knows that. It is no secret. It has been in the newspapers again and again. Do let the House remember that these schemes were tentatively put together by the body of men who held supreme political authority in this country, and that these tentative schemes, by the instructions of those in authority, were handed to the Chancellor of the Exchequer and myself to communicate to the representatives of the Bank of England. Can anyone imagine the extraordinary nature of the position? The governing body of the country, especially in the circumstances with which we were faced, producing schemes and asking the Chancellor and myself to go and communicate them to representatives of the other two parties, and then, when they have asked us to do that, to hold themselves in a position to say, we are not responsible. Answering for Labour, the former Home Secretary J.R. Kleins did exactly that, and claimed he and his colleagues were in fact not responsible for the cuts the cabinet had apparently agreed, saying, quote, I repudiate those repeated implications in the Prime Minister's speech that those of us on this side had accepted, sanctioned, and approved the various items to which he referred. The various items were in the nature of an economy or proposed budget agenda to be finally decided in the light of a complete picture. That complete picture was never presented. Meanwhile, another ex-Labor minister, Tom Johnston, condemned what he called, quote, a Wall Street government under the control of alien influences. The debate was wound up for the government by J.H. Thomas in what historian Reginald Bassett has called 
a devastatingly effective manner. Drawing on all his skills as a debater and fighting off repeated heckling and interruptions from his former colleagues, Thomas undermined the labor position, first by quoting Arthur Henderson himself as saying 56 million pounds of cuts had been accepted, and then by going through cuts in a variety of areas and showing that the labor plan and the national government plan was identical. By implication, how could the Labour Party now, just three weeks later, oppose what they had agreed to in August? As opposition members continued to shout that the figures were only provisional, Thomas replied, quote, Why did we sit then, in the midst of the crisis, day after day, if, at the end, we never intended what we were dealing with? You will not get over the fact that if the leader of the opposition himself said that as evidence of our anxiety to balance the budget, we provisionally agreed to this, then either we agreed that the budget ought to be balanced, or the 56 million pounds meant nothing. I answer by saying that the proposals which are embodied in the economy bill, so far as concerns the cuts in the wages of all workers, excepting none, teachers, policemen, soldiers, sailors, civil servants, all, every one of those cuts is no different from what it would have been if a labor government had faced its responsibilities. It may be that friends will shout, but if trade union negotiations are being conducted, and if an executive committee instruct a president or general secretary provisionally to go and do something, what would be said about that executive committee if the president and general secretary came back and they ran away from it? That is the answer. Hitherto, I have not run away. At one point, as Thomas asked that members respect differences in point of view, a Labour MP shouted that he had never respected Thomas all his life, to which Thomas, well versed in dealing with hecklers, replied, The honourable member says, with equal sincerity, that he never respected me in his life. That means, so far as he and I are concerned, that the position is status quo. The debate on the economy bill resumed on Monday the 14th of September in much the same tenor, but ultimately in the vote, Snowden's budget was approved by 310 votes to 253. The budget was to be balanced, but the crisis was far from over. It was now clear that the split in the Labour Party was far from amicable. And as we have seen, election talk had already started. On the 15th of September, Philip Snowden made his views on the matter clear after another ferocious debate, replying to Labour's Hugh Dalton, quote, The honorable member concluded his speech with a challenge. He wants a general election. He does not want it more earnestly than I do. I have noticed this during the last two or three days that I have been sitting here, being able for the first time in this house to see the faces of my old associates. I have admired the way in which they have cheered to keep their spirits up, and I have admired those who have done that knowing, knowing that only a few weeks possibly remain before the place that knows them now will know them no more. Snowden was implying that his ex-colleagues were about to lose their seats. What he did not realize was that the national government was about to be hit by a fresh squall in the economic storm that had blown apart the Labour cabinet. Would the coalition survive? Thanks so much for watching episode 12 of The Crisis. If you enjoyed it, then consider dropping a like because it really helps us out. And also, if you're not subscribed already, then consider subscribing to never miss another episode. As well as that, as always, we'd like to thank our patrons, including our executive producers, Eustace Abel, Jeremy Marcou, Tom McCool, and Tony Chirin for helping to support the show. Thanks so much, and see you in the next episode.